So it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Professor Sir Richard Blundell to this um, 2021 Economic Measure Conference. Richard is Ricardo Chair of Political Economy at the University College of London. Um, he's also director of the ESRC Center for the Macroeconomic Analysis of Public Policy at the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Um, Richard has received uh, many honors and prizes during, during his career, including the Johans, Johansson Prize, the Frisch Prize, the Lafon Prize, uh, the BBVA Prize, and the Nemes Prize, loads of those. Um, he has uh, given amazing contributions uh, to the academic uh, literature. Um, in areas such as microeconometrics, micro consumer behavior, uh, savings, labor supply, public finance, innovation, and finally inequality. Um, he's current a panel member actually of the IFS Deaton Review on Inequality. Um, so it's my pleasure to have Hisher here today. And he's gonna talk to us about his recent research on wage progression of low skill workers and the role of the occupations and firms. So we should, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Anna. Thanks, uh, Sam too, and everyone at, at ESCO. It's a really uh, wonderful development, ESCO. And uh, thanks to everyone who's made it happen and continues to make it happen and for putting on this uh, conference. What I want to do here today is look at some recent work um, that covers a, a number of the kind of themes that Sam uh, mentioned. So uh, I, I think I'll be touching on uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of those. Um, but what I want to do is to focus on what I think is an increasingly important issue for low skill workers, and that is uh, poor wage progression. Uh, my view is that it's absolutely central to understanding labor market inequality, and it pushes us away from simple cross-section measures of inequality to try and understand uh, the dynamics, if you want, of, uh, that, uh, of labor market inequality. It requires um, new data and new data linkages, and I'm going to show you what we have done so far. I should add right at the beginning, a big thank you to the ONS and to of course ADR UK for all their help, especially during the pandemic in uh, getting data to us and allowing us to use data remotely. Uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic service. So let me uh, share my screen and uh, see if it actually works. Um, I'm gonna just, uh, just check, um, Anna. Is that uh, yeah, is that yeah, okay? Perfectly fine. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So, you can see in the title a slight. Um, what I've focused on here is going to be on soft skills and uh, the role of the interaction between soft skills and firms. And I'm going to try and draw out uh, both things we might learn from the data about progression and also point to some uh, policies, both uh, general policies. Uh, training policies, firm style policies, and indeed place-based policies, uh, following up on uh, Sam's uh, uh, final point about uh, leveling up and the importance of uh, geography in our understanding of inequality, of course, in the UK, but, but everywhere we know this is a, this is a, a, key, a key issue. Um, so let me move to a little bit of background here and uh, see Again, Anna, is that, can you see the uh, second slide okay? Yes, it's perfect. perfect. Great. So here's a, here's a bit of background with some, uh, with some data, just to point out, um, I put at the top, it's depressing at the bottom. It certainly is depressing at the bottom. This is um, by education group. Uh, it's a, a, just the average of uh, wages in the, uh, among workers, of course, so nothing worrying about selection and other econometric issues at this point, I'll come back to that. Uh, but it, it just points that those who left school at 16, this includes everyone who left school at 16, and indeed those with even a little more education, have a very, very flat profile on average of wages over their life cycle. And indeed, um, one uh, probably the most depressing thing as a labor economist I discovered or we all discovered over the last 20 years is just uh, how flat and how little progression there is at the bottom. And the uh, 
rather dramatic effect on policy that we now know that employment is increasingly not enough to move families out of poverty and long run self sufficiency. So the old idea that let's get everyone in a job and then let them uh, grow in the labor market has turned out to be a little more optimistic than than uh, than uh, we first thought, uh, at least for uh, lower educated workers. And um, if you look at this kind of uh, in a policy sense, in terms of inequality, you and you just look at household, this is just household income growth picture again, just background here, using the family resources survey in this case, just looking at the red line, which is uh, working households pre tax pay. So it's just taking the earnings of working households, and looking at the growth, and you can see the growth among those with very low, um, the low percentiles of pre-tax pay in uh, the mid nineties, the growth, if you follow the percentiles through to uh, more recently pre-pandemic times, you can see that those at the bottom had very, very low uh, household earnings growth and those at the top, indeed, I haven't even put the top 1%, it would be extraordinarily high. Um, of course, once we add in uh, tax credits and benefits of those working age benefits, you can see that it makes up the line. We've done a pretty good job, at least we have been doing until recently, a pretty good job in stabilizing the income of households and families at the bottom. We moved away from that a little bit in uh, the last decade of reforms and especially uh, before the pandemic and moved a little bit towards minimum wages as a policy solution. And the general view I think we have, at least I have, is that both are good at supporting earnings at the bottom and you need, they're both, uh, they're complementary, they're not substitutes, uh, they're complementary, they have different targeting and they're both important, but neither do much for wage progression. So what it means is that families and individuals can be stuck on very low wages at the minimum wage, if you want, or a little higher for a good part of their career without seeing much in the way of wage progression. And then they're either supported through the minimum wage system or through the universal credit system. And uh, if anything, of course, we know this has become even more key during the pandemic. And this issue, in my view, of wage progression as we come out of the pandemic especially for young people entering the labor market is gonna be absolutely central. We know that uh, over that period, there's a huge increase in real government spending on working age benefits. And of course it stabilized around 2010 as we switched to relying more on the minimum wage, but really it doesn't really solve this more dynamic problem of how workers uh, develop in the labor market, certainly those who enter with relatively low qualifications. So that's what um, we want to look at here. I want to look at here. And I, I said that differential progression is really a key issue in labor market inequality. And understanding the determinants of progression also has key policy implications. I'll give you kind of three areas here. I'm gonna focus on the last one here, although my research and my colleagues' research over the last um, 20 years really has been trying to dig into these three areas. First is the role of education, labor market attachment and part-time work and gender. We know in all of those aspects, differential education background, you just saw that, has a huge impact in life cycle profiles of earnings. It, the labor market attachment also, in particular, the part-time work of women, for example, also has a huge depressing effect, of course, on their wage progression and can explain quite a bit of the difference between or the gender gap. Uh, and that's true also for educated women. And so that's uh, important. In the second sense, we also know human capital investments, not just experience learning by doing, but on the job training can be important. And what we've learned there is that uh, employer-based qualification training is the way to get things to work. And uh, you know they've got to be employer-based because they have to reflect the needs of the local uh, economy and, and the sectors that are 
thriving in that local economy. Uh, they need to be qualification or accredited because otherwise the worker can't take those qualifications with them. And that's a, a key recommendation, of course, as we look at the current package of skills um, uh, uh, programs, policies that are coming out of the government even in the Queen's speech today. What I want to look at here though, and this will uh, exploit um, as best I can uh, the uh, access to ONS data and the linkages there, is the role of firms and what attributes among the lower educated are valued by firms and which type of firms value them most. And what we're going to show or can try and convince you is that soft skills are particularly important there, not that they're not important across all education, all groups, uh, as it were, but for the lower education, they make up a larger proportion of their set of potential human capital. And we also know they're relatively manipulable and they're, uh, and uh, what we suggest here is they're, there's room here for thinking about uh, human capital investments as well in soft skills. But I want to first try and convince you that there's something here. So what I'm going to do is focus on three, uh, building on earlier work on wage progression, panel data analysis of wage progression, but exploiting the employer employee match data to investigate the role of soft skills. I should say this is a little ambitious, maybe too ambitious, and it does point to some of the uh, potential for further linkages that we could have at ONS uh, between uh, different government departments uh, and already happening actually, once we get the link between ASHI and Census, that's going to really help with this work. And I know that's already underway and similarly between HMRC data and uh, ASHI. But what I'm going to do is use what we have access to already and have worked in um, particularly over the last year or two. And uh, part of the policy here is to develop a good jobs agenda. That is to think about what is it that makes good jobs and what actually works at the bottom of the distribution. The issue of wage progression, as I say here, and good jobs for the lower educated, I think has become even more urgent for post COVID labor market. And I'll try and make a point of that as I'm going along. So our, our, our contribution here, well, the earlier work used the UK HLS, BHPS and, and uh, Understanding Society, and still does, by the way, that's unique and has some fantastically important uh, things that it can deliver. What I want to do here is dig deeper into why some workers, even at the relatively low educated workers seem to do well. What is it that's driving that? And do firms matter? and what skills will bring the largest returns? Uh, it seems an important question to me. So high quality linked firm worker panel data is gonna allow us to do this and to understand the patterns of wage progression and learn about what drives them. There's a couple of sets of lit literature here that um, are gonna be important. I've got relatively limited time, so I'm not gonna go through that but you'll probably some of you will be aware of the huge amount of new uh, new work on tasks and skills particularly by David Orta and uh, and uh, Darren Asimoglu that has really changed the way we think about uh, the dynamics of the labor market and is really important and uh, the other is uh, the nature of the importance of firms and firm matches Ultimately, we want to ask what are the potential policy levers uh, to improve pay progression for low wage, low educated workers. For those of you who know the data that I'm going to use, you can already see some challenges to answering these questions here. So we're going to try and take them on. What we're going to try and convince you is that um, we show evidence that workers in low educated occupations, that's occupations where low educated workers typically work, get higher returns to experience in occupations where soft skills are important. And these jobs are more common and workers experience higher wage progression when the firms are more uh, technological, more R&D intensive, more innovative. Surprising a little, but true. These are good firms and firms with a larger share of high educated workers. You can already see 
there's a kind of place-based um, firm level type of issue here in areas of the uh, country and this extends across many countries where there's been education flight effectively higher educated workers have left areas uh, left behind areas almost defined by that uh, older people and less educated younger people the ability to get good jobs is that much harder because you're going to see the complementarity of technology firms and firms with a larger share of higher educated workers. So I think this is really going to focus on what it is that makes uh, good jobs. And I think this uh, hopefully will have some impact in the policy area. We're going to develop a, a theory model as well, but again, I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on that. The data we're going to use is, um, is the ONS link data, largely. Um, the ADR has helped us so much in putting together here. If we're going to run it from 2004 to 2019 um, for various reasons of data availability. Uh, for the workers, we're going to use the annual survey of hours and earnings, uh, ASHI. Uh, for firms, we're going to link into that the annual respondents database, ARD and the Business Enterprise Research and Development Bird. ARD really is there to help us uh, get information about firms themselves, the employment, the workplace, the mix of skills at the, in those particular firms. And Bird is there to bring in notions of technology firms. Those are the firms that are doing a lot of, of R and D. To understand the nature of occupations, we're going to bring in two things here. One is ONET. Um, which is extremely useful. It would be absolutely wonderful if we had our own specific UK ONET, but we think that it's still relevant to use the broader ONET uh, information on occupations at the four digit level. That's the way we're going to match it in. And also the regulatory qualifications framework, the RQF to um, allocate workers to occupations according to education qualification needs. And this is, of course, essential uh, in data where we currently don't have linkages to actual education qualifications. Of course, links with the census is just going to help in many ways here. For robustness, we're going to look at labor force survey, which largely cross section, of course, with a small panel data element, but still useful in many aspects of what we want to do here. And to think about the nature of good jobs and what workers think are good jobs, we're going to link in with the European Working Conditions Survey on occupations, which we found particularly useful in doing this. So, um, as I said, the data on workers is the ASHI data. I don't really have to explain that data to this audience. Um, the, uh, it's the 1% random sample of UK workers. The 1% is, of course, going to restrict what we can do generally, but we can still do a lot. We're going to use the panel data nature of it, and we're going to use a fairly broad measure of wages here. And the firm identifier is going to allow us to match with firm data. I want to focus on the young, um, the uh, relatively young, um, and the baseline sample is going to be uh, males aged 18 to 49 for the period 2004-2019. Uh, and of course, we're thinking ahead of the new uh, entry cohorts and the kind of labor market they're going to face. We also look at, um, at, uh, at women as well in the labor market here. There are additional econometric complications when people are in and out of the labor market for various reasons. And of course, that becomes even more central for uh, women. But I'll, I'll come back to that. The labor force survey, many of you will know. The ARD data, again, I think you will know. If you don't, it's a sensor of, of data on firm structure, location, employment. We're going to use it to learn about the broad characteristics of the firm, uh, which is going to be uh, extremely important here. And, um, and BIRD is um, going to bring us to look at uh, R&D. When we bring in R&D, we're going to look at relatively large firms, 400 plus employees, I'm going to argue it doesn't make a huge difference. Generally, larger firms are firms that uh, actually give uh, better conditions and better wages. 
we're going to show that that isn't actually a feature of large firms per se. It's about large good firms, and good firms are going to be uh, defined through their R and D and their uh, there are other sets of skills in those firms. So ASHI doesn't include uh, information on individuals' education. So what we're going to do is, is use the uh, Appendix J of the Regulatory Qualification Framework. There are a number of other things you can do, but we wanted to match at four digit level. And uh, so we're using this to define our education, kind of education groups here. Uh, but really just thinking about uh, defining workers in the relatively low, uh, low, uh, low skill, if you want, low formal skill type of uh, jobs. And we want to think about uh, those workers. We're going to look across all workers, of course, but I wanted to break that down because, as you saw, it's really important in terms of wage progression. And indeed, it does a pretty good job. So here in ASHI, I've got the wage progression um, for the workers we're looking at um, on the left here. I hope everyone can see that by the categorization I just gave you, which lines up supposedly with um, the education levels in the data. And on the right, I've got the picture that I put up first, which is the uh, from the BHPS and USOC uh, combined data uh, for these three education groups. And you can see the broad pattern of poor wage progression at the bottom is very much uh, matched in the ASHI data. And that's the groups we're going to use. We'll look at various definitions, but I want to focus on that lower group and try and get to the bottom of why, what's going on there and why. And are there any successes? And what makes a success for a worker in, who's come into the labor market with relatively low educational qualifications? So there we're going to uh, look at what they're doing in the labor market. And we're gonna use ONET to identify the task and skill content of occupations, certainly not the first to do that. Uh, what we're gonna do though actually is focus a little bit more on one specific set of skills, uh, soft skills, um, which have increasingly in the last uh, four or five years, probably longer, but in the kind of policy uh, labor market uh, training type of world, soft skills have become much more, uh, seem to have become uh, uh, identified as much more important in uh, giving good job prospects uh, for lower educated workers. And of course, uh, the ONET is, it describes a mix of knowledge, skills, and abilities. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to work at the four digit uh, SOC level. Uh, and we'll keep just one measurement here. It's not going to change over time. Uh, and uh, that's going to be our, our key here. Of course, ONET is a, is a wonderful source. It's really not just <laughs> for researchers, it's set up to help. Uh, help firms and workers uh, make their choices and understand the requirements of jobs. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's an important uh, data source. And uh, we are doing work in other European countries where there are local uh, developments of ONET type measurements, uh, and we're getting very similar types of results there. What we're gonna do is combine um, 10 measures of soft skills into a single index. We could do much more and we do much more, but I'm gonna argue that a single index picks this up. So here's the list of um, what you might think are uh, and are defined as soft skills. So you can read them all and you can take your time and, and look through them in the paper or on the slides or certainly circulate the slides. And I think this has been recorded, so you'll see it there. Problem sensitivity, um, uh, and uh, 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 you can see the ability to tell when something's going wrong, the ability to listen, social perceptiveness, coordination, work with a group or team, coordinate or lead others, responsibility for outcomes and results, consequence of error, understanding the consequence of error, importance of being exact or accurate, and impact of decisions on co-workers. Think of this as a kind of a set of skills that are particularly important in work where complementary activities matter. If you're sitting in a warehouse just packing goods, that's not going to be very important. If you're in a 
an, in an environment where you're interacting, whether you're, a, whether you're a nurse or you're a receptionist or whatever, we've got some examples here. Uh, these type of skills are absolutely key. And what we're gonna argue is these skills are the ones that give you wage progression. And uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, it, what we do is, is take those, do a little bit of uh, simple single index analysis, um, just a principal component. We look at other components. I'm just gonna take the leading eigenvector and normalize that index from zero to one and uh, call that lambda. So lambda is our measure of, uh, of, soft, of, soft, of soft skills. Good, I, I shouldn't look at questions, should I, as I'm going along, but I just did. So where can we find the paper? Um, on my website. <laughs> and uh, it's being updated. We did quite a bit of work over the recent uh, past and uh, and uh, some of this is is relatively new in the paper and that's important so we're going to have three low medium and high i'm going to look at, at at those workers in the low educated uh, occupations but who have high soft skills in their occupations and that's going to be the distinction i'm going to be able to make they're spread across this is just uh, men aged 18 to 49 in private sector firms, 400 or more employees. So a pretty uh, specific group here. We're going to broaden out and look at how it works. It's going to be pretty general, actually. And these lambdas are kind of spread over. So we're going to be looking at the blue lambdas here. That is, um, that is the workers it, working in occupations that use these tasks, these particularly soft skill tasks. And uh, of course, soft skills are, are particularly interesting here. Um, hard skills certainly matter. We're going to find cognition. All those things matter a huge amount. That's forgiven. But those things are relatively easy to measure and verify. The problem with soft skills is we're not very good at accrediting them. And workers are also not very good at, therefore workers don't really have them written on a piece of paper that can take from one firm to another. So firms have to learn about workers with soft skills. And one recommendation here is that we just get much better at, at accrediting and training soft skills, but I'll come back to that. Um, what we first show is just raw data. Let me take, uh, the, those low educated occupations, men in those low occupation, ed, 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 education occupations, and then split them into this uh, soft skill split. The red line is the wage progression for the soft skill group. And you can see it just takes off relative to the others. And when we saw that, we thought, hey, we're onto something here. It does look like there's a group here do well. We knew that there was a group. It's not everyone, of course, um, but there's a group here that do well, and that's kind of quite exciting because that's where we could come in and act. And uh, it's really the first time, I think, using this kind of data, we've been able to go in at this uh, depth. By the way, um, another thing we found, and this is probably uh, quite hard to see, but I'm gonna come back to this, is that firms that are technology firms, um, they do, uh, workers uh, with high lambda in those do, do much better too. And uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, but there's this combination of soft skills with the type of firm that are going to really give uh, this uh, potentially exciting outcome of better wage progression for these uh, lower skill workers. Um, what we're going to do is, is also just, uh, I'll just do this quickly, confirm that this does actually line up very well with what people think are good jobs as well. This idea that these types of, of um, soft skills, workers working in these soft skills are working in jobs that they think are good. They give good way of progression and they, they um, have good uh, outcomes generally. What we do is look at, at four measures that are measured in the European Work Conditions Survey on the Likert stir and just, and just line up our Lambda soft skills measure with them. And it's quite amazing, actually. If you look at my job offers good prospects, you know, these are very correlated. So 
one thing, you probably can't see this, but let me just pick out something cleaners at the bottom. They don't do very well in terms of soft skills. They're very low on the soft skill level. By the way, we find they're the, they're the first thing to be outsourced. Uh, workers with low levels of soft skills or working in occupations with low, low tasks with low levels of soft skills are the first task to be outsourced. Uh, they've got no complementarity with other things going on in the firm, so they're easy to outsource. Other, where soft skills are coming in and being complementary with other activities in the firm, they're not outsourced, and we can see that uh, very clearly, and I'll come back to that. But look at the, as we run through these, you can see a kind of strong uh, correlation, that's all it is, of course, uh, between uh, the types of things that people call good jobs and our measure of Lambda. So we develop a little model of how this could work. And again, I'm not gonna go through that, uh, but it's, I think makes sense. We're developing a rather different type of production function, what people often call O-ring production. That is production which has a certain set of tasks which are complementary to other assets like R&D, to higher educated workers and those things in the firm and a set of tasks that are not. Uh, very complementary, they're substitutes, and they're the ones that do rather poorly in wage progression, and they're easily outsourced. You see, oops. What we do here is, um, what we do is develop a panel data framework. You think that, given me, I like uh, thinking about panel data framework. It's not the time to bore you with all the detail, uh, but we think of, uh, if for those of you familiar with kind of just running a panel data model with workers, worker I, you know, in, uh, in, in occupation J and firm F at time period T, we're gonna run a fairly general panel data model, which has two important components. One is a lot of heterogeneity. People are different for lots of reasons, and we want to allow for that. In fact, we're gonna use the travel to work areas to make sure we get area differences in this. We're not picking up things spuriously here. And the leading term, that phi term, is going to capture the interactions between Lambda, which is the soft skills, and the tenure of the firm. You know, does Lambda, as, you, as, as firms learn about your soft skills, and as you stay in the firm, is it that that gives you this higher profile? But you have to worry, of course, about the usual panel data things of heterogeneity, time effects, and of course, uh, just regular stochastic uh, errors. What we do is we allow um, that term to have a couple of interactions. We allow an interaction with Lambda itself, this index of soft skill, and the index of soft skill interacted with a, a, a nonlinear function of tenure in the firm and we go through exactly what we're going to measure there in our regressions uh, once we control for individual worker effects. And effectively, it's the average effect on wage progression um, uh, in the firm of having high levels of soft skills. And that's gonna be uh, the way we're thinking of it here. So to the regressions, um, I'm aware that I wanted to leave, uh, leave good time a few minutes at least for, for, for questions and uh, interactions. And there's lots, uh, lots to think through here. But the main point is that High Lambda really does, even when you control for everything that I went through here, including worker effects, year effects, travel to work year, travel to work occupation interactions with year, controls for age, tenure, tenure squared, gender. Uh, here I'm looking at men only, uh, so uh, ignore that gender that gender uh, dummy, uh, uh, full on part-time and firm size. So all those things are in there. And what we are focusing on here is, well, how well does, how well do these uh, soft skills play out in your wages? And how does it affect you as you go through your, uh, your tenure in the firm? And you can see here that it's very important. It gives a boost to your wages and it gives a an increasing boost to your wages. So it affects your wage progression. And what we show is that's not just in the firm. As you go through your lifetime, these effects matter and they accumulate. Of course, because soft skills are not really easily verifiable, as you go from firm to firm, uh, it takes a while for your soft skills to be uh, developed. 
And that kind of thing already points to the policy here that we really need to do a better job of measuring and accrediting and training soft skills. So I just to mention that. What we then do, take those basic results, which I, I think uh, were, were the thing that really uh, got us interested here, and think about what, what is it about the firm? I've talked about the skills of the worker and the tasks they're doing, but I haven't really talked about what type of firm, the firm match that matters. And so what we first did here was um, look at, um, look at, uh, good. What we first did here is to, <laughs> again, I shouldn't look at the, uh, at the chat, should I? Uh, we, had, we had a term in, uh, the, in whether it's a kind of good firm measured by its technology. In other words, it's R&D intensity. So R&D uh, over its size uh, using the bird data, because that needs to be 400 employees or, or more. So you'll see a slightly so smaller sample here, uh, but you're going to see very, very similar results and interact that with tenure as well. And we include a level term, of course, here. So what you find here is that we get the first effects that high lambda matters. Just look at that last column. High lambda interacted with tenure is important. So it's growing and it grows as you go through uh, it, 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 your time in, in, in the firm. But also there's an extra boost that comes if you're in a firm uh, that has higher R&D intensity. So we're beginning to learn that firm matches matter. And this is where the theory came in really, just thinking about what it is about production, productivity, what kind of production function would mean that even for lower educated or lower skilled workers, these soft skill abilities are complementary and valued uh, by firms. And that's been the key point here. We go on and add in further, uh, and in another important thing, this is where we need the AR, I, A, R, IRD data linked with ASHI and with BIRD uh, to put in uh, the, the intensity in the workforce of the proportion. In fact, we value it by their wage as well. So the value, the value of higher educated workers in the firm. And we find again, that gives an additional boost. Uh, so, you know, matching if you're, if you are a low educated worker with soft skills, matching with a firm that has um, these uh, technology and also high educated workers is really key in getting wage progression. And you can see how we're thinking of policy here. We shouldn't be scared of technology. Of course, technology is gonna employ less low skilled workers, but now we know what kind of uh, workers, even among the lower educated, are going to thrive in that kind of environment and do well in terms of wage progression. We also know from this that if, a, if you're matching with a firm that uh, just has lower educated workers, uh, you're gonna do less well. A firm that has a mix of workers is gonna have the kind of production function, the kind of productivity that develops uh, with, it, that, that generates these, uh, higher wage progression. So just to uh, wrap, kind of begin to draw, uh, sorry, that was rather quick through the ideas here, but as you can see, I'm quite excited by it. There are many other measures of tasks and, uh, and task-based indicators, and we look at that and we show that what we're doing here is completely robust to that. We can put in indicators for cognitive ability and other, other types of ability. And uh, in particular, the set of abilities that uh, Asimoglu and Otto have developed and taken in slightly different directions by other authors here. And I, I won't go to those tables, but the table you that you saw uh, is robust to these inclusions. Uh, what we were particularly interested in is, uh, is how this works out in the first job. And what we did here was um, look at um, the importance of the first job where you're going to learn about these skills and develop these skills. You can see that what we've got here is uh, on the right is first job uh, and you're using soft skills here. And you can see that's clearly much more important. 
And so, uh, again, thinking about what skills are going to be really key for low educated workers as they come into a particularly difficult labor market now, I think this has hopefully got something to say. And you really couldn't do this without being able to link all these data sets. So that's a point I wanted to make. Of course, it points to things that we could do even better if only we could link the census, and we will do, I know, that's already happening, and other, other data sets so that we can dig even deeper and uh, get measurements of some of this uh, heterogeneity that we're, um, we're looking at here. Finally, just to talk about training, we know that low educated workers are very poorly trained in the UK in terms of their training once they're in work. And our earlier work, recent work actually, on the importance of training just showed that. You, this is for men and women, it's from the BHPS and the USOP, which has very nice measures of training actually. And it just shows that the low educated, those that leave school at 16 have relatively low uh, training and uh, it declines with age relative to the high school and university group here and women notice the drop up jump up I won't go into that but that's quite important it just shows how important training is uh, as women come back into the labor market actually especially among the more educated here so that's going to be key what we wanted to do is uh, look at whether uh, when you've got soft skills and you're in these soft skill occupations in these good firms, do you get more training? And you do. So what happens is when we look at Lambda of your occupation and we look at uh, high Lambda occupations, we see much more training even among these uh, lower skilled uh, men. And we replicate this for, uh, for, uh, uh, um, for women as well. In the European Work Condition Survey, we also kind of fix up our lambda measure and look at training in that. And it's very strongly linked. So again, this use of the European Work Condition Survey is, is very nice in turning things around and seeing what we find um, from these questions about what are good jobs and what have you. So I'm going to, uh, I can see Anna's there. I'm going to just say we did lots more robustness. I want to, um, I want to just summarize and say a couple of things on policy and, uh, and then I'll be done. Um, so really what we've done here is, is try to exploit the ONS linked data in this, I think, quite exciting way of being able to dig into what is it about, what, what is it about the type of tasks that people are doing and what is it about the firm they're in that leads to these better outcomes when overall we see very poor outcomes among this group. So this is, uh, I think, very important here. And uh, we just point out results uh, here, summarizing what I've said. In terms of policy mix, I think it just says we just have to get away from the old things that I must say, I spent a lot of time at IFS studying, like universal credit and minimum wages. They're really great, at, they have been, um, and they remain, and of course, during the pandemic, they've been shown, especially universal credit, and the enhancement to it to be absolutely critical uh, to keeping family incomes up. But they're really not designed to help with wage progression. We can imagine adding incentives, but I think we need to dig a lot more detail here and think about what it is. And hopefully this work is pointing at least to some aspects of this about the firm and the skill. And of course, we've got some developments in the labor market which are pushing the other way, like solo self-employment. Uh, where you're not connected to a firm, you have very little uh, in the way of access to, um, to uh, training. And so those are key there. Just to finish, this alignment of the type of firm and the necessity to have a good deal of educated workers at the workplace, if you want, or in the firm at least, uh, to get good wage progression is a really challenge for place-based policy uh, because it says you just can't walk into somewhere and, uh, and expect to set up something with good wage progression. It's a really a combination of things that does it, the skills of the worker and the type of firm and the type of workers in the firm that are going to uh, give us the good firm and good, good jobs uh, that we really want. So let me end there, Anna. It was a bit of a rush through, but I hope that uh, it was uh, useful. 
Thank you, Risha. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I keep you know, wondering about the impact that the lockdown had on, on the fact that people move from the hospitality sector jobs to jobs in places like delivery, which I guess are more uh, low, uh, both low qualification, but I guess uh, would be a job with, uh, with lower level of soft skills, as you, you mentioned there. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, I think we, you know, as they, obviously they've been good at holding incomes up, but as we now move into the workplace, we also think that one key issue about these kind of skills we focused on here, they're kind of adaptable and they work well with technology and they work well with higher educated. And that's what we have. We, you know, we know we, we have a set of new technologies we'd like to roll out. These are the kind of, even at the bottom of the labor market, these are workers with the kind of skills who are going to thrive in that environment. And I think that's, that's you know, going to be uh, key as we come out of the pandemic. Thank you, Richard. So I'm going to call uh, people uh, to answer their questions. So I'm going to call the three questions we have so far. Uh, Kesha, Maria, and Matt. So Kesha, maybe you could start. You can unmute yourself, ask your question, then we're going to collect the other two, and then we should going to answer. Oh. Hello. Yes. Hello. Oh, yes. Uh, this is a fantastic paper. I uh, really enjoyed presentation. I mean, this uh, soft skill, uh, there is a word lambda was quite uh, uh, novel to me. My question is, you had so many factors in the in a soft skill. Uh, how did you determine the weights uh, to going to the different elements, uh, each element? So you said you did the principal component analysis. So how did you come to the one measure of the soft skill index? Uh, would you please explain on this? Thank you. I, I can. Isha, well, can, you, can you move to the next one first? Uh, Maria, yes. can you ask your question? Thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you, Richard, it was a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. Um, my question was, I was wondering whether this uh, importance or complementarity of soft skills is more related probably to another item of intangible assets of firms, which is organizational capital or other items that are less knowledge intensive than R&D, and whether you had um, uh, tried um, so to estimate this rather than R&D. I mean, I'm asking because we find similar results on the effect of R&D and the TTWA level on um, routinized workers who didn't work on wages so far. So it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting that it's like that. But um, I was wondering whether there's uh, uh, other items of intangible assets of firms that might be more related to soft skills rather than R&D. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, so let's get another one then we should answer it. Uh, we have a question by Matt. Matt, uh, he's not working. Uh, so I guess I guess his question was about: uh, Was there any consideration for movements of individuals across the thresholds of education defined? Uh, for example, a low skilled worker in retail may be funded subside for a degree for the qualifications by their employer, which could then contribute to wage growth via promotion to a management position or his educational prerequisites. So I guess it's, it's in uh, firm uh, training. Richard, if you could address these issues so far. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. Great questions, of course. Thanks, Ishab. Yeah, it's um, the weights are there. We um, we in fact do, as, as you said, uh, we take principal components. So we're taking loading factors. Um, it's a very good question. I, I can probably I probably won't do that right now, uh, but I've got the loading factors, and it's a really good. Uh, it would be, ah, yes, I can probably tell you um, what the, they're fairly evenly ones, but the ones on problem sensitivity, on coordination, on social perceptiveness, active li listening, um, and on impact of decisions of co-workers, I'm just looking at the quotes, had the slightly higher uh, loading, and uh, we would like to investigate those more. And again, the limitation of the data here is, you know, we're not, we, what we'd really like to do now is go in and measure measurement of the workers themselves. Uh, and 
we're not able to do that currently. Uh, so we're looking at the jobs and tasks they're doing. And uh, that's, uh, and, and I think we're making progress, but there's plenty more to do here given given this. So that's that one. It's a little bit similar answer to Maria. Fantastic question. I think of these firm attributes we've discovered as uh, proxies for other things, I think. Um, it's absolutely right. Uh, although R&D is a very good signal of a, of a, a you know, a much more productive uh, company environment. And what, one thing, one of our first findings uh, actually uh, with Rachel and Philippe and Antonin uh, right early on was that it, this old finding that large firms have uh, pay higher workers is really a bit misleading. It's really large firms that have uh, some kind of more driving technology. They're, they're firms that are much more uh, what we might call frontier firms. And uh, you can kind of think of that actually when you, when you think of just retail or something like that. So I think there's something in it, but I agree that it's a proxy. It's one of the measurements we could, could have here. And we were kind of rather pleased to find that the share and the value, if you want, of high educated workers is very important here. And that kind of drives our idea of complementarity. There are other things that, that bring, you know, these different attributes of production together to, to, to give you this higher productivity and higher wages that the, these workers are, are, are getting. Uh, indeed, the way we think of it is there's a, you know, there's a higher surplus here. And because of the complementarity, uh, they can bargain that. And the idea is that complementarities uh, also lead to dri driving up workers, uh, work wages, and 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 that's that's important here here too. Yeah, Matt, on um, on on skills and training, that's absolutely right. So on the work on the BHPS and understanding society, and indeed on on um, the the LFS, we can track the workers and their training that they're getting, and we line that up very closely with this. Uh, but the kind, what we do know is that workers in these uh, soft skill uh, tasks are getting more training. That seems to be very highly correlated, and it could be quite important training. And you can imagine exactly what it is, and it could it could be um, you, you know it, it could be level three or level four, and what we'd really like to do is is understand that better. The linkage of training data with ASHI and uh, the other uh, uh, and firm based data isn't particularly good. Um, it, we've done some work on Norway where all the qualifications that everybody gets it, are linked with the data directly and we can see this accumulation of skills and qualifications happening we've been less able to do that here but we can look at the pathway in uh, in these other data sets and uh, that's what we find that it lines up very closely with lambda and with this uh, this measurement of soft skills so this complementary parity between that and the training you get is also of course very very important I hope that answers some of the uh, questions. I, I think you did really well. Um, um, I don't know. I, I think we, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna end uh, this this uh, session. I, I think it was it was a great talk, um, and I think we learned. So I learned the, the issue of soft skills and how you can have uh, your wage increase over your career. Otherwise, it looks like it's, it will be flat. So this is what I'm gonna take away. Uh, yep. So thank you, Vishal, for your talk. Thanks, thank, uh, thanks for addressing the, the issues in the Q&A session. And, and I, I want to say for everyone, uh, I hope to see you in the parallel sessions during the afternoon. We're going to have two, two, two groups of parallel sessions of three papers. There are many things to choose. Uh, we're also going to have, at the end of the afternoon, we're going to have a panel discussion. And, and remember as well that you can get in, in the... Um, in Zoom breakout rooms during the cough break, so you can keep the discussion uh, during the um, uh, that you start uh, in the parallel sessions. Okay, so hope to see you all later. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.